Dear friends, hello. I understand that it's not that easy to be sitting and listening uh, to different panels, but this is the exercise that we are meant to do. So I would uh, very much appreciate if you regain your seat and you allow, slowly but not too much, our next panel uh, to begin. Uh, once that all the guests, uh, all the panelists have uh, reached us. So I think we are missing uh, Joao Albuquerque and Anna and Badia. Badia, where are you? Here is Badia. In the center, in the center, Anna. No, Anna, sit in the center. Yeah, she should be in the center. Okay. So let's begin by apologies on the on the communication. Our friend Carlos Lopez is here representing the African Union, but we will introduce him when we will give him the floor. Now, before beginning the panel, let me remind all of you that you are supposed to vote for the president. So the delegations are uh, supposed to cast their ballot uh, by half past five uh, at the latest. Please remember that uh, the ballot is there on the right side of the of the room. I guess we are all here now, and uh, so let me begin. Please, a moment of silence, seriously, and otherwise we cannot start. Our idea is to is to have two angles of perspective in this panel. We would like to tackle the major issue of international trade on the basis of our position, the position of our family. We believe that a big part of uh, building those alliances between progressive forces is based on new policies on trade. And it's inevitable that a family like ours concentrate all its efforts in, uh, in this endeavor, in this aspect. And we will do this by uh, beginning with the intervention of uh, Paul Magnet, which I doubt needs a lot of presentation, but I'm happy to do it anyway, besides being uh, 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 the mayor of Charleroi, he has always, he has been in the forefront of the negotiation uh, on uh, CETA, and he has gained uh, a tremendous uh, uh, visibility and uh, also has provoked a very important debate within uh, our family on uh, that uh, trade agreement. He is part uh, of this uh, very prominent advisory group that the GPF, uh, the Global Progressive Forum, has built with other prominent personalities and therefore it will be a pleasure to hear from him to illustrate the findings of this advisory group and the proposal that this uh, report as for uh, all uh, our family and beyond. Paul Magnet, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Giacomo. Thank you for holding this session on those issues which are very, very important and which I'm sure will play a prominent role in the next campaign. And thank you for inviting me. As you just said, I'm not just talking in, in my own personal capacity, but also on behalf of a group of people who have written this report, which is available here, and I highly recommend it. Uh, to try and redefine the vision of the socialist on those issues of the global economic order and international trade. Because let's be honest, much too often, we socialists are seen on those issues as part of a global and very vague consensus with the liberals and the conservatives. We are seen, in other words, as part of the establishment in this respect. And this should not be the case. And we should dissipate this misunderstanding. 
It would be a huge mistake to lead a campaign that would oppose the populists on the one hand and the pro-Europeans on the other hand, especially on those issues of trade. Because, because first, as already said by Andreas in the former session, people not only want more Europe, they want another Europe, and we must be the face of this other Europe. But also, but also because on those issues of economic global doctrine and free trade, Populists are hardliner free traders. They are not on our side and they are not anti-European. They want more Europe for a more liberal Europe and we oppose such a simplistic vision. So we have to have our distinctive and clear identity as socialists. And what does that mean? It means first that for us, trade is not an end in itself. Trade is a means. Trade is just an instrument. It's an instrument that we must use to promote our political values and our political objectives. And those objectives are simple and plain. First, we want to fight poverty at the global level. We have a historical responsibility, notably vis-a-vis -vis our neighbors and friends from Africa. They are not responsible for global climate change, but they are suffering for global climate change. Their population we double by 2050 and the young people who are born there want to make their live there. And we should make sure that they can make, make their live there by helping them developing their own sustainable eco economic uh, model on their own continent and notably through an access to our market. And second, we Europeans and we socialists have always believed that trade should be used in as, as an instrument to set global standards. Of course, we do not believe in a closed world. Of course, we're not protectionists to think that we can rebuild national boundaries. But we want an open and regulated world. We've been struggling for more than a century for the, for the rights of the workers and for collective bargaining. We are the world champions of the fight against climate change. And this should be the purpose of trade. We should tell to all those who want to get access to the European market the biggest and richest market on the earth. Okay, you want to be our partners in terms of trade? Then you have to help us promote the workers' rights and the fight against climate change at the global level. And any treaty that would not purport those objectives should not be accepted by the socialists. Second, we as socialists will also want to address the consequences of trade. Very often when you listen to the free traders, they will tell you, well, trade only has got advantages. Trade will produce growth and job and this and that and more peaceful world. But we as socialists know that very often this is not true. Every day we meet people who have lost their jobs because of economic global change. Every day we see that regions are declining because of global economic change. And we think that the EU does not only have a responsibility to reshape the global trade area, but that the EU also has a responsibility to give an answer to the citizens who are suffering from the consequences of, tra of, of trade. We have the instruments, we have the social fund, we have the structural fund, and we need to transform and to change the existing globalization fund to make it a real transformation fund to help all those peoples who suffer from the consequences of trade. And we need new and additional resources for that. Yes, we need a tax on financial transactions. Yes, we need a carbon tax at the borders of the EU and new and additional resources to help the people who say, we are with you, but please help us and protect us against those major changes. And three, and that's, this will be my last point, we have a big problem with the method. We have a big problem with the way those agreements are negotiated today. More often than not, those trade and investment agreements are negotiated behind closed doors in a very opaque manner. And what happens be behind closed doors? Well, it's always the most powerful, the richest, the best organized interest who win. It's always them who have their voice heard, the corporate interest, 
the big multinationals. And we as socialists cannot accept that. We have to plea and we have to ask a much more transparent, a fully open and inclusive process of trade negotiations. We have to ask for more democratic accountability of those who negotiate before the representatives of the people, democratically elected by the people. This is for us a key condition. And to conclude, the title of the, the, title of the report is very simple. What we want is a global economic order which is designed for the many, not for the few. The few have had their time. It's the time of the many now, it's the time of the socialist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. It was, uh, it was perfect to the point, and uh, you gave uh, a lot of food for thought to, to the Congress and uh, to everybody that, uh, that will read and will learn from uh, what the group what the advisory group has, uh, has elaborated. You mentioned Africa. Africa is indeed a crucial partner in rethinking our model of international trade, but not only. It's a crucial partner to rethink, I would say, the whole process of uh, globalization. And it is crucial to have a partnership with Africa that is meaningful, since the destiny of our two continents are inevitably interlinked and interdependent. It is a pleasure to have here with us uh, Carlos Lopez, which is the high representative uh, of uh, the African Union for precisely the partnership uh, with, uh, with Europe. And he's also a member of the, uh, the group, the advisory group, that uh, will uh, reform the African Union uh, system and model. That group is led by Paul Kagame, if I'm not wrong. Carlos, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be a fifth column in your uh, meeting. It's a friendly presence. And I think I'm in company of a like-minded group. So allow me to be very frank and direct. Africa is the third largest trading partner of Europe after the US and China. This is not known. Most people don't realize. Why? Because the statistics produced about trade in Europe always fragment Africa. And there was a reason, institutional reason for it. Africa until now it was not a composite that we could call a group for trade negotiations purposes. But that is changing. In March this year, Africa has signed the Continental Free Trade Area. There are only four countries that have not yet signed, and they are on the way of doing it. And we expect ratifications to attain the necessary level by June next year. So we are talking about a very different partner that Europe has to engage with. And guess what is happening? What is happening is that we have no less than 17 different European instruments dealing with Africa. Not all on trade, but the majority of them have some consequences on trade. As a result, the fragmentation continues. It comes in the way of different forms of negotiation. One of them is the famous economic partnership agreements that I would say any analyst in Africa hates because it fragments Africa even further. These economic partnership agreements are not really taking off. That's the reality. And they are not taking off for political reasons. There is only one in Southern Africa that has so far entered the stage of implementation. But even that one does not comprehend all the Southern African countries. So it is a complete disaster. And we are counting on people like you to denounce it. Because what we need to do is a continent to continent negotiation. Why is it? Not just because we are the third largest trading partner. In fact, we are more important for Europe in trade relations than Japan. Africa is more important than all of Latin America combined. 
Africa is more important than Australia, than Canada, countries with which Europe is negotiating seriously about trade. With Africa, we want to negotiate through development instruments. I have nothing against development instruments, but the reality is that the totality of aid that we receive from Europe is less than our trade deficit with Europe accumulated in the last two years. And I'm saying in the last two years, before that period, we were actually in a surplus. So we are going in regression, and we are being compensated with trade packages that are supposed to be progressive, but in fact are undermining our integ integration project and are shifting us again to negotiate aid instead of trade. We, for a long time, wanted aid instead of trade, but we have matured. Our GDP in the last 15 years has doubled. We are no longer a partner that should be looked at in a dis disconceiving way about what our future promises. And that's why we need this debate to change. We need a shift in perceptions, we need a shift in mindsets so we can have the right conversation. And the right conversation is not to negotiate with the North Africa as your neighbors and then with the rest of Africa as Africa, Caribbean and Pacific and within that have distinctions for certain countries that are considered more important than others and so on and so forth. That time has to be over. We need to have the, 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 the reality of Africa present in the negotiations. And we need Europeans to have a different attitude. And we are sure that a group like you commands incredible influence to change this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. It is indeed this group that will have to change the way, the way things are done, and this is why we are preparing on the basis also of uh, the report of the GPF, of the resolutions that will be discussed and adopted today, and the manifesto that will uh, be uh, discussed and adopted in Madrid uh, in February. Uh, we will outline how much we are dedicated and committed to change the way things are done. And in this respect, uh, it will be crucial to keep this uh, uh, partnership with you alive and to elaborate further in a common way our, uh, our position. The second angle that we wanted this panel to address, it is, uh, it is what we consider uh, in a formula the value-based foreign policy that should characterize a progressive family like ours. And uh, this is uh, definitely the case for PES. And one uh, of our main uh, uh, preoccupation in this, past, uh, in this past years has been the tragic uh, evolution in uh, Turkey that the current government has taken under the leadership of uh, Erdogan. The, in fact, involution, not evolution, to be correct. It's an involution in terms of uh, basic democratic uh, principles, of uh, human rights, of freedom of expression, of freedom per se. One of our member party of PES is the HDP, the Kurdish minority main uh, political representative. And today we have the honor of having uh, a member of the Turkish parliament from uh, HDP, Badia Otskorce Ertan. Hope I'm pronouncing it uh, correctly. She's one of uh, the few that is still a member of parliament because many others have been deprived of being active members of parliament by being arrested uh, by what we are not shy to call the Turkish regime of today. Because silencing the opposition by placing them in a prison, it's a clear act and conduct of an anti-democratic regime 
not of a democratically elected government. I have here with me Lauror, the book of Seladin de Mirtes, the, the party leader of HDP, with a, which I invite all of you to get in uh, bookshops or online and to read it. It is uh, inspiring. It is written while he is in prison very much in these days. And it is from this uh, Congress and with the testimony of uh, Badia that we launch our appeal for the liberation of Saladin Demirtas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, we have been under tremendous repression in Turkey over the last two years, which I will detail in my speech. But I would like to start by my expressing my party, HDP's thanks to the party of European Socialists, who has always been with us in Turkey in these most difficult times. I would like to especially thank Mr. Sergei Stanichev, the president of PAS, and Gachimo Filibek, Deputy Secretary General, who have visited us several times to join hearings of our co-chair Selatin Demirtas and also in front of prisons to express their invaluable solidarity. Let me continue with sending my warmest regards to all women political prisoners in Turkey, especially to Ms. Leyla Güven, an MP of my party, HDP, who started an indefinite hunger strike in prison on November the 7th. Leyla was arrested because of her criticism of the Turkey's invasion of the Kurdish enclave of Afrin in northwest Syria in early 2018. Although she should have been released after she gained her immunity by being elected to the parliament in June 2018, the court refused to release her. Her hunger strike is to protest the Turkish government who has been unlawfully preventing his lawyers and family members from, from visiting Mr. Abdullah Öcalan in prison since 1999. Mr. Öcalan was a key figure in peace negotiations between 2013 and 2015. Ms. Güven stated that such isolation of Öcalan from his lawyers, family and the public was not simply about the violation of his legal rights, but it has obstructed democratic dialogue for a peaceful resolution of the Kurdish conflict. Leila hopes that ending isolation of Öcalan may help to resume the peace process. Over the last three years, an authoritarian regime was established in Turkey. The character of this regime reveals itself best in its crackdown on the Kurds and the HDP. The crackdown on the HDP has been going on since June 2015. Currently, more than 5,000 members of the HDP are in prison. Our former co-chairs, Selahattin Demirtas and Figen Yüksekta, one current and eight former deputies, and over 70 elected Kurdish mayors among them. The European, Human, uh, European Court of Human Rights recently made a judgment and asked Turkish authorities to end the Pretrial detention of Mr. Demirtas and release him immediately. But President Erdogan declared the court decision not binding and said, we will make our counter move and finish the job. Due to Erdogan's interference, the local court refused to implement the judgment of the court. The finishing of counter move came on December the 4th, when the Court of Appeals held an unprocedural session and took an accelerated decision approving a four-year and eight-month prison sentence that Mr. Demirtas received from another lawsuit. As you may know, during the two years emergency rule that ended in July 2018, more than 150,000 people were purged by decrees, over 2,000 NGOs and 
200 media outlets, many of, uh, many of them Kurdish, were banned. More than 160 journalists are in prison. About 80,000 people were arrested in total. Among the imprisoned are politicians, human rights activists, journalists, academics, and many others who have nothing to do with the coup or terrorism. The Erdogan regime weaves anybody critical of its politics as a traitor or a terrorist. Although it was lifted in July 2018, all practices of emergency rule continue full force. Arbitrary detentions of our comrades and systematic torture are routine practices of the day. Emergency rule, which is supposed, supposed to be an exceptional and temporary measure, has become the rule with the establishment of the presidential system. In the new Turkey, there is no separation of powers and no independent, independent judiciary. We now live under a permanent emergency rule that has no room for oppositional voices. And as the new regime is based on racist nationalism, militarism, and right-wing populism, we expect the HDP and the Kurds to remain as a main target of state violence in the future. Unfortunately, the European Union and Council of Europe have not taken a serious and effective position with respect to the developments in Turkey over the last two years. Probably mostly due to the refugee crisis. Yes, from time to time they have prepared reports and expressed concern about democracy and human rights in Turkey, but that was pretty much all they have done. This inaction has unfortunately left the opposition in Turkey isolated and helped Erdogan to consolidate his rule. To conclude, rising authoritarianism, racist nationalism and right-wing populism are not issues in Turkey alone. They are global problems. That's why we are in need of strengthening uh, international solidarity networks more than ever. Despite extremely difficult conditions, we are confident that with the help of solidarity of our comrades across the world, we will survive Erdogan's authoritarian uh, rule, and we believe that we will win. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Badia. The international of the authoritarian nationalists is indeed gaining uh, some ground around the world, but that only means that we will keep fighting uh, even broader for, uh, for our values, uh, and, uh, and that we will not stop. The more they ally, the more we will create our wider progressive alliances with movements like uh, yours, and with movements like uh, um, Akbayan in the Philippines. I would like our friends to uh, to show the video that uh, Riza Hontiveros, uh, the senator of the Akbayan uh, party in the Philippines, has uh, recorded for us. As you know, in the Philippines there is another, not really democratic, uh, uh, leader in government. I'm talking about Duterte, and. Uh, PES and Progressive Alliance, uh, members of the European Parliament, have been on the forefront in uh, addressing uh, the issue of basic uh, respect of human rights in that country, especially in light of uh, the extrajudicial killings of uh, almost uh, 15,000 reported, maybe more, uh, in the, what is supposed to be the Duterte administration war on drugs. Uh, we have been visiting the country, we have been uh, appealing uh, for uh, the European Union uh, to take a clear uh, stand against uh, this kind of uh, uh, unacceptable practices. The European Parliament uh, has adopted uh, a resolution, and I would like to praise uh, our MEPs, uh, Soraya Post and Nina Gil, for their uh, job in, uh, in that uh, negotiations with the other political uh, groups. Uh, we will uh, keep fighting from Turkey to the Philippines and wherever it's needed 
to show that we are uh, coherent with our values. Please show the video. The yes. Party of European Socialists, to my friend PES President Sergei, and to the PES Women President Zita, I'd like to extend my warmest solidarity to your Congress today. Thank you for the support you've extended not only to my party, Akbayan, but also to the Filipino people during a most challenging time in our nation's history. In April this year, and by a large majority, the European Parliament, through the leadership of the PES and the Socialists and Democrats group, approved the resolution calling for an end to extrajudicial killings. In the same month, your Deputy Secretary General, Giacomo, suffered deportation by our government for criticizing the President's abusive and corrupt war on drugs. These gestures of solidarity from you and from the international community indicate that our family is at the forefront in resisting dictatorships. As a government that prides itself in tough talk and empty machismo, the President is deeply sensitive to the criticisms he receives. So, to be candid about it, keep them coming. As socialists and social democrats of the world, our work is cut out for us to recapture the imagination of global citizens against the tide of populism, racism, and fascism. This recommitment is magnified as we commemorate International Human Rights Day on Monday. We always go back to the values we hold dear, international solidarity, social justice, and the protection and promotion of human rights and human dignity. Friends, there will always be those who will sow discord, distrust, and build walls to divide peoples and us versus them. But we will continue to work and work hard together to break these walls down. Our movement will forge ahead, and together with you, we shall shape a progressive world that we want, fair, free, and sustainable. Couldn't be said better than that. Riza is a senator of Akbayan. She is risking to be also uh, prosecuted by the judiciary in the Philippines under totally false allegation uh, on a prefabricated cases uh, by, by government officials uh, themselves. So our solidarity goes to Akbayan and to their leadership. Before continuing this journey and jumping from the Philippines to Latin America, I just would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, the Prime Minister of uh, the Republic of North Macedonia, Zoran Zaev, who just joined us. We will have uh, the opportunity to listen to him tomorrow in, the, tomorrow in the plenary. Thank you for joining, Zoran. As I said, from the Philippines, we go to another continent, uh, to Latin America, with uh, Alvaro Elizalde, who is the president of uh, the Socialist Party in Chile, who is a freshly elected uh, senator in uh, the country, and uh, who is a very good uh, comrade and friend to the European uh, Socialist Party. We have all followed the election in Brazil, and we all raised our concern for uh, the success of uh, Bolsonaro. We see this uh, shift taking place in a continent that uh, in the past decades was more of uh, uh, an example of uh, left uh, progressive uh, governments that were uh, leading, uh, leading uh, the continent itself. It's a moment of crisis, as you know, also in Europe, but we have to restart with uh, revitalizing our movement, starting with the example that under your leadership, the Partido Socialista de Chile is uh, undertaking. Alvaro, the floor is yours. Thank you, Giacomo. It's an honor to be here again. Uh, I will give uh, my speech in Spanish. Uh, hace um, tres años y medio, Three and a half years ago, I 
took part in the Congress of the European Socialist Party at the time. And I gave a brief overview of the situation at the time in Latin America. Now at that time, not today, you had a majority of a plurality of left-wing governments. Some were more populist, with an autocratic slant. But then you had the democratic left, social democrats, with policies to improve the way of life and the quality of life of our peoples. Just looking across the whole continent of Latin America, there were very few conservative governments in power. Then you had sustained economic growth in the continent as well. After the crisis in 2008, there was an unprecedented wave of economic growth across the continent, and that reduced poverty dramatically. The best example is the policy implemented by the Lula government, where 40 million Brazilians made their way out of poverty, and there were policies in Chile as well. That was the country where poverty was most dramatically reduced in all of Latin America. And then, the main social politician, the main uh, social partner, democratic partner of Latin America was Europe, but the, made, the main trade partner was China. Latin America's economic growth was determined by its ties with China, and that's still the case today. So if you look at the cycle of economic growth, you have the commodities boom. And that was set out by the demand for raw materials coming from China. Today, the landscape has completely changed. We have a majority of conservative governments. We've had soft coups taking place across the continent. That's led to the removing of some people in power in Paraguay and also the removing of President uh, Rousseff in Brazil. This also has to do with China. It has to do with China dangling economic growth above countries to get them away from recession. You're looking at negative growth in Brazil, 4%. That's also the case in Argentina, hard hit by a recession. And what of Venezuela facing a structural recession that's dealing with internal struggles. But the Latin American economy is once again on the uptick this year after years of stagnation. But what's happening with this political turn? What's happening with this slant to the right? Well, it's not just about the rise of the conservative powers in the continent. What else has happened? Well, you've also looked at the rise of far-right populism. Now, these were movements that have been largely absent from Latin American politics after the end of the doctrine of national security and the military dictatorships within the Cold War. As you know, in the 70s and 80s, many Latin American countries were held under dictatorships. But since then, there had been no far-right thought in daily political life in the government. Now, the election of Bolsonaro in Brazil is a clear warning sign. It's proof that the far-right is gaining ground in Latin America, and it's gaining popular support. So the question we have here is, so what's changed? What's brought about this change? Well, there's the economic situation. But it's not just that. There's a second factor as well, and that's the issue of security. Now, apart from Chile, Uruguay, and a number of other countries that have very low rates of homicides, lower in fact than the United States, and only a smidgen higher than in Canada, the remaining Latin American countries are facing homicide rates that are absolutely through the roof. They're sky high. If you look at the example of Central America, every year, more people are dying as a result of crime than the deaths generated by the civil wars in these countries. Crime is the foremost cause of death, causing more deaths than during the civil wars in those countries. And it's easy for the populace to swoop in and establish their far-right ideas. And of course, they completely disregard fundamental rights as part of what they do. Then you have 
the constituencies that used to vote for left-wing parties, who climbed out of poverty due to leftist public policies. But as soon as they climbed out of poverty, they started to view conser conservative ideas as a good alternative to defend their interests. And you have traditional constituencies that voted for the left. But if you look at what's arisen now, the differences uh, with the rise of the middle class, these are also constituencies that have moved to the right and even to the far right. They're against, for instance, gay marriage. They're against equality, uh, gender equality. And so they've been swept up in the political ideologies of far right parties. So there's no doubt about it. This is a grave concern. It means that we must reaffirm and reiterate our values, our principles, our traditional principles, but all in seeking solutions, forward-looking solutions, to the threats that our people feel in a globalized world. Sometimes these are threats that are tangible, but then there's also the specter, the haunting of threats across our culture, and that's not so easy to uh, understand in a as a tangible threat. That's a breeding ground for the far right. And here, our partnership with Europe steps in. We share values. We share principles. And the challenges that the Latin American left is facing, in many ways, are aligned with the challenges that what Europe is facing, or what you faced in the post-war period. Firstly, it's about deepening and strengthening democracy. You have women voting for sexist candidates. You have uh, people of African descent voting for racist candidates. And you have people uh, who are foreign born of uh, an immigrant background voting for anti-immigration policies. Then there's also the issue of inequality in Latin America. Latin America is no longer a poor region. There is a great deal of poverty in our region, but thanks to progressive leftist governments, there has been a dramatic drop in poverty across the continent. But despite this, we're still facing massive inequalities. It's the continent where you have the highest levels of inequality, not just on a political level, but across every aspect of daily life. And thirdly, we must move forward to an inclusive model for development, investing in science, technology, and innovation. Latin America boasts great natural wealth, but we're being threatened. We're being threatened by exploitation and the massive export of our raw materials. And the other threat is privatization. So we need significant investment in science, technology, and innovation that will allow us to have a platform for inclusive and sustainable growth and development, above and beyond exports to huge economies like China, though it has, of course, been fundamental in the growth of our continent. The left is facing many challenges worldwide, not just in Europe, but also in Latin America. But there is no doubt about the fact that we must continue to reiterate our principles. We must generate solutions to bring change to our citizens. We must meet the needs of our citizens, the ones we've always represented. We've had successful experiences, like right here in Portugal and in other parts of the world, and that serves as a springboard for us to reflect on how we can continue to move forward together and build a fairer, more democratic society with better living conditions for everyone. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Alvaro. Thank you very much, Alvaro. We are living difficult times, but we are ready to restart. And we have a great opportunity with the European elections, as we know, to recover and to launch a different uh, message of hope for Europe and beyond Europe. We believe that the younger generation have this aspiration to know what is the role of Europe in the world what is in fact the role of this generation to make the world a better place. This is why we would like to ask uh, the president of our youth movement, uh, uh, the Young European Socialist, uh, Joao Albuquerque, to share with us briefly, briefly, because we are running out of time, his views, the views of his movement on this respect. Thank you, Giacomo. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Boa tarde a todas e a todos. Um, I, would, I would start by saying that 
this is the right moment for us to be here and to discuss what we want for the next European elections. I'm really proud that we as young European socialists have just adopted our manifesto and that we have managed to be the first European youth organization to come up with an uh, electoral manifesto uh, for the European elections. And this, and this manifesto has six very brief concrete points that we believe that go in line with what young people are hoping and expecting from us as a movement. The first thing that we need to do is that we need to defend and protect our planet. There is no planet B and there will not be a tomorrow for us to start discussing what we want if there is no planet and if there is no uh, sustainable resources and resources that are available and clean for everybody. The second thing is that we need to make sure that we give the right tools to young people to face the times in which we are living. And this means that we need to transform and change education in order to make sure that it tackles the challenges of the labor market and of the digital revolution. The third question is that we need to make sure that the European Union has an economic system that works in favor of young people. That doesn't benefit exactly like Paul say, the few, but it works in favor of the many. We have been having a European Union that is implemented and is embodied of neoliberal values that protect the, those that don't need the protection and we need to make the economy work for young people. Fourth, we need to make sure that regardless of who you are, regardless of your background, regardless of your ethnicity, if you're a person with disability, if you're an LGBT person, if you're a woman, if you're from any kind of minority, that it doesn't matter because the European Union will have common values and will com have common rights for you to make sure that you have equal opportunities and equal uh, access to uh, all means and all resources all over the, the European Union. Then we need to make sure that the European Union is not an exclusive European Union, it's an inclusive one. And that we don't allow member states and that we don't want the member states to leave. We want them to stay in this project and we want them to continue to be part of this family. We don't want a European Union of 27, we want a European Union of 28 and possibly if more in the future enlargement. And last but not least, we want a European Union that doesn't allow for people to continue to die outside of our borders in the Mediterranean and that we make sure that we protect the lives of those that are trying to fight for a better life inside of the European Union. I will conclude very briefly by, by saying that we are all aware that we are facing very difficult times and we have debated this all throughout this morning and we will continue to do so in the next days. We know what we are facing with our opponents. And it's very simple. To populism, we have to go back to respond with a popular movement. We are a people's movement. And therefore, we need to defend ideas that work for the people. With, to nationalism, we have to respond with international solidarity with, and with globalism. Making sure that these values are defended on a global level and these objectives are fulfilled on a global level and then implemented at the local level because I see a lot of mayors here from Portugal and this is very important that we give the power to the municipalities to implement these measures and to change the communities and the way that we, and the way that we live as a society and as a community. I will, I will finish by, by quoting um, uh, a Portuguese author that I strongly recommend that you read. I will not say the whole, his whole sentence but the basic outline is something that should inspire us for the European elections that are coming. And we are in an old country. This is a very old country and a very old city with a very long history inside of Europe. And this, this quote, basically, from Antero de Quental says that in the moment that injustice and oppression appeared, so there it appeared socialism. And this is what we need to remind ourselves, and this is what we need to uh, be pushing for in the next European elections. Thank you, Joao. And now it's uh, a great pleasure, pleasure to introduce a very old friend of our movement. Um, she was, in fact, one of us. She has been working for the Party of European Socialists before becoming the Minister of European Affairs and Trade of the Swedish government. I'm talking about our friend uh, uh, Anne Linde, who give us the honor to be here, still representing not only the party, but also the Swedish government, because, fingers crossed, 
Stefan Levin will stay as Prime Minister of Sweden. And that's very good news. Thank you very much, Giacomo. Yes, let's all hope that we will stay in government because the alternative is so terrible. I don't want to think about it. Uh, but uh, just to say, we shouldn't even applaud that. <laughs> um, I think I should say uh, something mainly about trade because uh, there, of course, we have some uh, different uh, opinions in, uh, in our party and I think it's very possible to, to have a common um, way of uh, having both our different uh, ways of seeing it. Because as I and, and many others who are uh, working a lot for, for free and fair trade see it, it is actually a way with trade to be more open, to uh, work for peace, to work for development, and not to close ourselves into a fortress of Europe. And when it is trouble time, we shouldn't try to hide between, between walls. We should do the other way around. But the gains of an open economy need to be much more fairly distributed. And there is a big difference between the liberals and conservative who talk about free and fair trade and social democrats who talk about it. Because the fact is that there is always people who will lose from trade. Because if you are not competitive enough, then you will not be able to, to sell your products. And then the question is, which is the answer? Is the answer to stop trade? I mean, being like a planned economy, like in the old time, or is the answer to have social democratic policies in your different member countries where you have safety nets, where you have reskilling, where you have possibility to uh, get absolutely good um, um, uh, economic compensation while you're seeking for an, a new job? The fact is that in my country, where actually one out of every three jobs is because we have export, one out of every three jobs, there we have a security council. So if your uh, company cannot survive, for example, because of the competition of trade, then you go to the security council. And what we can see is nine out of 10 people, nine out of 10 has a new job within one year. And in that year, you have enough compensation to be uh, possible to, to continue to live the life just as before. I think that is the social democratic solution and not to uh, try to protect every workplace or every business, but to protect every people, every person. The anti-trade rhetoric is kind of um, not uh, an empty talk anymore. With the last year, there has been more than 5,000 protective measures and only 1,500 that has been liberalizing. And actually, protectionism is hitting fragile and vulnerable countries the hardest, with negative effects on youth unemployment, hope, lost hope for the future. And instead of saying that we should give uh, not the possibility for African countries, as was mentioned here, or third world countries, by closing trade, it's the other way around. When we have trade defense measures in EU, we are actually making those in the rest of the world suffer. I remember Nelson Mandela, he came to Sweden, the first country outside Africa when he was released, and he said, what you did was to be protectionistic. I ask you, please, please, let us sell our products to the European market let us build our economy, 
But what you did was to be protectionistic, you put quotas, you put trade defense instruments, and we couldn't sell our products to you. And I'm very sorry, but I will never forgive you for that. That was what El Nelson Mandela said, and I totally agree. I think that we can use trade in a positive way. For example, by um, linking feminism and trade. Um, as you know, I represent the first feminist uh, foreign policy uh, in the world. Now we have a few more countries. We have the first feminist government in the world. Now we have a few more uh, who has joined us. Uh, and what we did, for example, was to, together with UNCTAD, take a gender toolbox for trade agreement, so that every trade agreement should be looked at also with feminist eyes to see what is good for women, what is bad for women in those trade agreements. And that's possible to do. The same thing goes with agenda 2030, there is a lot of things like labor interest, environmental interest, everything that you can put in those modern uh, trade uh, agreements that we are negotiating now. And by the way, it's we trade ministers and the commission who are actually negotiating the trade agreements uh, and not the corporate uh, interests. We also have a very interesting new um, activity that was started by actually Stefan Levin called the Global Deal. And the Global Deal is meant to have a social dialogue between trade unions, governments and business on a global level, instead of moving the business where they have the worst conditions. Now the Global Deal has more than 100 actors. Actually, the number 100 was the Spanish government who joined the Global Deal. And before has been the French government, many other governments, trade unions, uh, and business. And actually, now it's the um, OECD and ILO, who is now taking care of uh, moving the uh, global deal further. Finally, because time is running, I will just say that um, when it comes to the feminist governments, we always talk about the three R's. If you're going to do a feminist uh, uh, foreign policy for real, you need rights, you need representation, and you need resources. And you have to have clear goals, and you have to have action plans. And actually, when we started the foreign policy, we often came to think, and we are three women ministers at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Me, it's Margaret Wallström, who is the uh, Social Democratic Foreign Minister, and we have a Green Minister, Isabella Levine, who is also party leader of the Green Party. The, they have two, a woman and a man. And we often came to think about the uh, sentence that Mahatma Gandhi said, when you try to do something new. And he said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Yes, we will, we will, we will. We couldn't think of a better way to conclude this panel than by inviting the Minister of Foreign Affairs of our hosting country, a very successful government, the one of uh, Antonio Costa, and I'm very happy to give the floor to Minister Santos Silva to conclude with his consideration this panel. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Very briefly, I will uh, try to draw three conclusions of this panel. Conclusion number one, we need effectively to build up a progressive alliance. We have to imagine a progressive geopolitics. And we need to uh, assume our leadership role in many of the multilateral agendas 
uh, in the world. And we have to coordinate ourselves in uh, uh, doing what we can in order to foster agendas like the climate change agenda, like the sustainable development goals agenda, like the agenda for migrations, like all the positive and progressive agendas that we have to foster in the international organizations to which we belong. Conclusion number one, number two, sorry. We need to envisage new forms of economic partnership between uh, namely the European Union and continents like Africa and regions like Latin America. We have to favor with our action the dynamics of integration that we can see in Africa and also the dynamics of integration that we can see in several parts of Latin America. And in order to do so, we have to defend, to be the apologists, of fair trade. Fair trade means free and regulated trade according to the highest standards considering the environmental uh, impact, the food security, healthcare, and also fighting, for, uh, fighting against abuse. Conclusion number three, the last one. We have not to fear the ideological debate and the ideological battle. We need to defend our values, and nowadays this means three very concrete consequences. We need to fight against authoritarianism. We cannot be ambiguous towards authoritarian regimes, be them of right or left, be them European, Latin Americans, African or Asians. We are socialists, so we are for liberal democracies, so we have to fight against any form of authoritarian regime. Second consequence, we need to fight against uh, the neoliberal ideology, the neoliberal orthodoxy, here in the European Union and outside the European Union. Third consequence, we need to understand, all of us, that xenophobia, populism, anti-migration, are not compatible with social democratic values. And we need to say this loud and clearly within our family and in our dialogues with the other uh, political families. It's not legitimate that social democratics can be ambiguous in what has to be its basic fight against populism, against xenophobia, and against nationalism. And this is a very concrete consequence for all of us. Thank you.